Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the Believers of Boyo. Last time we left off, after officially adding the blood feeding meme to our ideology, we also did some trading, accepted another quest for the Empire, and took out a group of pirates with a toxic spewer. And as we begin today's episode, we are finally assigning our colony a leader. You guys voiced your opinions on this and the result was pretty clear. The role of Big Believer will now go to none other but Light, Sanguophage and resident master of all things Psycasting. And by making a Sanguophage our leader, our colonists will get a small mood bonus. Not to mention that, as one of the original five colonists we started the series with, Light just feels right in this role. Obviously, that is not to say that he's going to hold it forever. Eventually, we might also have one of our youngest, like Ellie or Elpis, replace him. But at least for the moment, Light will lead the Believers of Boyo in the colony of Rat Chapel. And there we are, the role change has been completed, the ritual itself does not give any mood bonuses or penalties. However, Light's expectations have been bumped up by two levels, he now has elite expectations, coming with a minus six mood penalty. He does, however, also receive a positive plus four mood bonus for being a revered blood feeder. So one way or another, it all evens out, and so we can begin with today's first real project. As you can see, we are in the process of mining out a sizable room next to our prisons and bedrooms, and we are also expanding some of the bedrooms that we already have. The reason for that is a quest that we received in the last episode. The Empire has asked us to house one of their knights, who will be accompanied by eight court allies. Obviously, we want to accept that quest, and so we are spending pretty much the entire first day here preparing accommodations for them. Late at night, then, we receive an interesting inspiration for Ellie. A significant trade price improvement might just qualify her to lead the next caravan trip. As you can see, she already has a solid social skill of 6, and with the inspiration, her trade price improvement is 27%. Our go-to trader Kevin, meanwhile, with a social skill of 11, only has a 16% improvement, so we definitely want to make use of this. Day number two then continues pretty much the same way day number one ended. These larger bedrooms we are currently mining out will be for Brandon as well as for our two Sangophages, Light and Vulek. They are revered after all, so I think it's fair to give them something nice. Speaking of which, just in that moment we unlock mortars, which is going to be extremely useful, not so much because we can now build more of them, but because we can now manufacture our own mortar shells. Up next then, I think it's time that we finally unlock fabrication to make our own components, and for that we need to unlock the multi-analyzer first. So let's get started with that, watch as Volek receives a shooting inspiration, while our new and improved bedrooms are assigned to their respective colonists. The large room that we are currently still working on, by the way, that is going to be a hopefully impressive barracks. I simply did not feel like carving out eight separate bedrooms for the royal entourage, and if we prep this nicely, they should have no issues sleeping here. Still, we are not going to just mine all day long. Around noon, it's time for Light to give his first leader speech, and while Squix and Kraleth seem a bit skeptical standing outside of the room here, the remaining colonists all listen eagerly. Nonetheless, perhaps the only two adult women in the colony had the right hunch, as Light's first speech is entirely uninspiring, and so unfortunately we do not gain any mood bonuses or development points. So in about 10 days, he will get a second chance to try again. In the meantime, Maniac finishes mining out the last bits of stone here, and with that we are ready for step two, smoothing all of that stone floor. This will obviously take a while, and I would like to wait until it's done before we invite our Imperial guests, because as part of that quest we need to keep them happy, and obviously we will have a much easier time doing that if the room looks nice from the beginning. On the next morning then, just as Took receives a work friends inspiration, Maniac runs into some more trouble with a rhino. It looks to me like he just can't help himself. Either way, a few uses of the stun side cast allow him to escape safely, at least long enough until our backup arrives, this time consisting of Vulek, Kyle and Kraleth. And together the four of them manage to take down the animal. However, Kraleth suffers a nasty bruise for her efforts. Thankfully though, her brother Kevin is quick on the scene to patch her up. A few hours later then, an Imperial shuttle arrives, not to bring in more guests, but to pick up Maple, the paralytic snow hare that we had to take care of for a few days, and who is now ready to return back home. And that completes a nice and easy quest, the reward were a few points of honor for Kevin, 
however not quite enough to advance him to the next title of yeoman. Now for the rest of the day we are keeping our colonists busy, as usual, Wyatt is making mortar shells, Volek and Dimitri spend the afternoon preparing our rooms for the guests, and in the evening Ellie follows in her father's footsteps and goes on a food binge. Because of her gourmand trait, that is something that will occasionally happen, just like it does with Turk. However, this time we actually have Brandon and his Word of Serenity sidecast, and cancelling the food bench only costs 30% of sci focus. It will also put Ellie in a psychic coma, but only for 6 hours, and it's night time anyway. And I think that's a fair price to pay to teach her that gluttony is not the way of Boyo, a lesson that we might perhaps want to teach to Turk as well the next time a chance presents itself. Just a few hours later then, Ali is back up on her feet and spends the night learning, although just for emergency purposes we do want to make sure that she re-equips her SMG. Now on the next morning we can watch as Maniac attempts to hunt some alpaca, but with very little success. Because of the combat in darkness precept we do get a noticeable aim penalty during daytime, and even Maniac's level 18 shooting skill is not going to change anything about that. So, to counteract that, and to make use of the aim bonus we get for fighting in darkness, we are now switching Maniac to a night owl schedule. Just like Dimitri, he is now going to sleep during the day and be awake at night. In addition, his quick sleeper trait should make sure that we get the most out of that schedule, while in terms of hunting, we switch to a slightly different approach in the evening. After all, alpacas are not quite on the level of rhinoceroses and can therefore relatively safely be engaged in melee combat, so that is exactly what Wyatt, Kyle and Kraleth spent their evening with. As you can see, it is clearly not an entirely safe strategy, but it yields results much much quicker than Maniac ever could. Not to mention that any injuries received will most likely heal quickly. After all, an alpaca is unlikely to deal permanent damage to a sufficiently armored colonist. One morning later then and our barracks are slowly starting to take shape. We already have 8 beds with end tables and are currently constructing some dresses. Two small sculptures should also be enough to make the room look nice and beautiful. So I think we are almost ready for our guests to move in. Over in the kitchen, meanwhile, Tuk is already preparing food for our visitors. The night among them will be fed with fine meals, but the rest will receive simple ones, otherwise we simply won't have enough fungus to keep food production going for as long as they're here. And so, I think it's time that we officially invite our guests over now, and after thinking long and hard about this, I have decided that we are not going for the honor reward this time. A legendary quality sniper rifle and a masterwork SMG are just too good to pass up. We will definitely see more quests in the future to earn that honor, but in this case I think it's fair to go with the weapons, especially considering that the sniper rifle will make for an excellent hunting weapon, and that we have recently decided to make packaged survival meals our trade good for the future, so it all fits into the bigger picture. Now, with our guests arriving and the shuttle eventually leaving again, we should keep in mind that none of these 9 visitors will do any work whatsoever. The best we could do is give them some weapons, draft them and perform some manual hunting that way, but apart from that they will just spend their entire day hanging about and having a good time. And well, considering that it's our main goal to keep their mood high, I would say more power to them. We'll see whether or not all of this works out for a grand total of 25 days, but for the time being our extremely impressive common room is doing a serviceable job and because we do at least have control over our guests' schedules, I have also set up a few hours of meditation every evening. This should ensure that they raise their recreation bars even further, should they not be filled already. As the night sets in, the royal entourage then bunks up in the barracks. Our simple meals apparently also not of the highest quality, and considering that we've made them in batches, this will most likely not be the only case of food poisoning. Still, I don't think it will bring the mood down too much, and it's not like we're missing these guys on the productive end of things. And so, after a hopefully restful first night in our colony, we rejoin everyone on the next morning, a morning that we use to slightly expand our Sanguophage's death rest chamber. In the process, we conveniently also find some steel, but mostly we're doing this to put in a few more death resting facilities. However, just a few seconds later, our attention is briefly taken away by another fight in our common room. Last time Vulek and Light got into it, this time Brandon and Tuk are fist fighting, and at least for the moment it looks like the two of them are somewhat evenly matched. 
And indeed, Brandon even manages to level up his melee skill. Only to level 3 though, and Took is much much better than that. Still, the fight ends in a surprising draw, with Brandon unfortunately losing his right pinky, something we might want to keep in mind should we come across a suitable replacement. Took meanwhile suffering no further permanent injuries on top of the ones he already had before the fight, and so we can let the two of them rest and focus on some good news instead. The weather controller that we accepted as part of a quest a few episodes back has finally ended, and with that the permanent fog we found ourselves in for the last few days should finally clear. Still, the good news are swiftly followed by some bad. Looks like Randy has decided that it's time for another raid, and this time we have pigskin breaches attacking. And well, not just a few, 62 of them, but I think I have an idea, and it once again involves light and a doomsday rocket launcher. Our enemies, meanwhile, seem to display a rather curious behavior. Despite them still being pretty far away from our base, they have already begun blowing things up. Looks like the corridor through the caves here is just a bit too narrow for them. Either way, this is buying us some valuable time, not to mention that they can't quite manage to completely avoid friendly fire. On top of all that, it also keeps our enemies nice and clustered together, so perhaps we won't even need to use that doomsday rocket launcher in the first place. At least for the moment, we will simply have Light turn invisible and then skip him closer to the enemies, at which point we can then unleash one of his famous berserk pulses. Especially with plenty of grenadiers in the enemy ranks, this should cause a good amount of carnage, and it also looks like the pigskins are far from done blowing their way through the caves here, so I'm pretty sure we can repeat this once or twice. And so, as tempting as it might be to just follow things up with a blast from the doomsday, we are simply getting light back out of here now while the invisibility still lasts. Thanks to a few portable shields, our enemies have also gotten tangled up in a chaotic melee, but we'll gladly take it, it should only make things last even longer. Eventually then, as the fighting slowly dies down, it's time to launch attack number 2. Once again invisible, we skip light close to our enemies, and then unleash another berserk pulse on those that are still standing. Once again then, Light can retreat while our enemies scratch and claw themselves to pieces. Should we eventually have to fight them ourselves, this will also waste a good amount of their shield packs, not to mention that whatever is left will be extremely vulnerable. A few moments later then, we once again skip in and launch another Berserk Pulse. This time we actually have to deactivate the Neural Heat Limiter, but that's mostly because Light has left the Altex Staff of Sin at home, otherwise he would be able to easily handle all of this. Our enemies, meanwhile, have properly decimated themselves. At this point, they are already down to less than half of their original force, and that is very generously counting everyone who is at least still alive. Their actual remaining fighting strength is, of course, much, much lower. And so, it is no surprise that after another pigskin goes down, the rest of them decide to flee. And so, Light has officially once again fended off an entire raid by himself. So, he might not give the best speeches, but when it comes to things like this, there is nobody quite like him. Defeating all of the enemies here has also given our guests some convenient mood bonuses. A little less convenient, meanwhile, is the fact that Maniac has once again attracted the attention of several rhinos. Thankfully, though, he is once again able to outrun them and to lure them back to the base. And, well, even though we are not quite getting out of this fight entirely injury-free, and even though our boomalopes once again decide to run around right in the middle of the carnage, it doesn't really take us long for all three rhinos to go down. And with that, our guest's food supply for the next few days should now also be secured. Wyatt, meanwhile, the only one slightly injured in this fight, Took and Brandon still suffering from the injuries from earlier. All in all, nothing that a good night of rest can't fix. During that night then, Maniac somehow manages to enrage yet another rhino, this one however all on its own and therefore quickly eliminated. On the next morning then, we can watch as our bears and elephants start hauling away valuables from the site of the attack. Of course, the majority of weapons here are not really anything that we want to use at this point in the series, but if we take it all together, then they might fetch us a good price, especially considering that Ellie still has that trade price inspiration. That is also why at this point we are basically just waiting for Light to refill his Psy Focus meter, and in the early evening he has finally done so, so let's load up some transport parts. This time it will be Light and Ellie going on a journey together, and as you can see they are taking quite a lot of goods with them. Most of it are indeed weapons salvaged from our fallen enemies, but Wyatt has also steadily been making rhinoceros leather dusters that we can sell, not to mention a few other bits and bobs that we have acquired over the last few days. 
And after several hours of loading, our parts are then finally ready to launch in the middle of the night. And this time we are trying out the other settlement belonging to our good friends of Anum. In the last episode, we visited the one north to our base. This time we're going south. And well, selling all of our goods makes us a neat three and a half thousand silver, enough money to purchase yet another death rest capacity serum for Sanguophage Volek, and we are also grabbing a cooking skill trainer for Ellie, maybe this allows her to already take over some cooking duties from her father. Now we still have some money left over and they do sell an Arcotech leg here. At the moment I would like to hold off on that because it would cost us pretty much all the silver we have left, but we might want to keep this in mind to the next time we come here. What we are not going to pass up at this point, however, is an excellent quality charge rifle. Consider it a worthwhile investment in our defensive capabilities, and against some of the weaker animals of the jungle it also makes for an excellent hunting weapon. As usual then, we take the easy way home using Light's fast skip, and just a few moments later, on the dawn of a new morning, we switch things over to Vulek, who is now able to ingest not one but two deathrest capacity serums, raising the total number of buildings that can connect his deathrest casket up to four. However, we have already constructed the maximum of two deathrest accelerators, so we'll have to think a bit about what the next two will be. In the meantime, food poisoning strikes another one of our guests, and to prevent that in the future, let's give Ellie the cooking skill trainer we just bought. In one swift go, this now bumps her cooking skill up to 10, and I think that's enough to at least share cooking duties with her father. Her father, meanwhile, is taking his old buddy Maniac out on a hunting trip. Back in the Cult of Jinx, the two of them were already best friends in all things combat, and now that we have two charge rifles, they can easily take down some boomalopes. Conveniently enough, it's currently raining, so the explosions won't do too much harm. In the kitchen, meanwhile, Ellie is already working on her first batch of fine meals. Of course, she will still need to spend a good amount of time learning, so she won't take over cooking duties entirely. Still, at 8 years old, I think we can trust her with some responsibilities in the kitchen. Suddenly then, one of our guests collapses in the common room. It quickly turns out to be just a side effect of the food poisoning though, combined with the fact that they are a delicate wimp because of the genie xenotype. A short while later then, we are extracting massive amounts of blood packs from our colonists, as we require a grand total of 10 to build two glucoside pumps. Next to the deathrest accelerators, these are arguably the most useful attachments to deathrest caskets. Each one boosts the deathresting pawn's movement speed by 12% until their next deathrest, and we can connect up to four of them. So in just a few days, Vulek will be zooming around faster than everyone else, although we do want to keep in mind that all of these death resting attachments consume a moderate amount of power, at least while they are in use when someone is actively death resting. So perhaps it's best if we don't entirely go overboard with them too quickly. Alternatively, we could of course construct a few more water mills. The food poisoning spree then unfortunately continues, but so far it only affects our guests and let's be honest, they really don't have anything else to do anyway, and who is going to reject the meals of an 8 year old? In the meantime, with everything constructed, Vulek can now begin his death rest. In about a day or so he would have to start it anyway, so we might as well do it now as another night is about to set in. Now connected to two deathrest accelerators, he will only take two and a half days to complete it, so let us skip ahead to the next day, which sees the entire steel vein in our deathresting chamber mined out, and at this point Squigs is already working hard on making things look nice again. And to be completely honest, that is about the most exciting thing that happens on this day. At this point, our colonists all have their daily routines and some work to do, so they are keeping themselves busy, even if we don't have any large-scale projects for them. In the evening then, food poisoning case number 4 or 5 strikes our guests, and coincidentally it is once again the genie who collapsed earlier, so I think it's safe to say that they are definitely not having the best time in our colony. Nonetheless, at least for the moment, we do not need to worry about their mood. Before the night then fully sets in, we have rare thrombos appear, and not just a few, a grand total of 6, and of course we do want to hunt them all, so it is once again time for Berserk Pulse. Just two charges and we already have four thrombos fighting amongst each other. A third charge then unfortunately backfires and has the thrombo chasing light instead of its companion. But we come prepared and quickly have our backup assembled. And from that point onwards, a combination of stun, vertigo pulse and just pure gunfire renders the thrombo pretty much harmless. We even brought our animals as backup, but as you can see, that is hardly necessary. So, that's one thrombo down, let's lure in the next one, the other four are still occupied with each other. 
This time we send out Light to use his medium psychic slug psychast, which actually hits quite hard and combined with Skip would probably allow him to solo a thrumbo like this. As you can see, the injured animal doesn't even make it as far as our ambush. One volley from Tuck's charge rifle is enough to take it down. In the meantime, we have a third thrumbo emerging victorious from the fight with its companion. Once again though, it does not withstand the combined firepower of our colonists. Eventually then, the last victor approaches and is once again shot down pretty fast. And with that, we now have six dead thrombos at our disposal, even though the hunt took us all the way into the early morning hours. Still, this presents a lovely boost to our colony wealth, now sitting at about 210,000. And we are also getting ready for our next trade trip, as the Imperial settlement over here is about to restock its goods, and thrombo horns are definitely on the list of items that they're interested in. With all the meat we are currently butchering, we should also have enough supplies to restart the production of packaged survival meals, and perhaps we can even make a bit more money before we send out our drop pods, as we now have a general goods trader in orbit. And this one is the bringer of bad news for Donkeys, Blossom and Malthus. I think it's time that we sell them, they really fulfill no further purpose in our colony. On the bright side, they will be able to join a sizable herd of other donkeys, so I think in light of selling them, this is the best we can do for them. Apart from that, we are only selling a few unwanted clothing items, the trader here does unfortunately not have anything we need, and most of this is stuff that the Empire won't buy anyway, not to mention that Kevin gets a much better price for it compared to Brandon. Shortly after then, the Royal Tribute Collector once again passes by, but as always, we don't really have anything to give to them. Somewhat ironically then, the fallen pig skins are slowly being consumed by boars, while we are now in fact beginning to make more packaged survival meals. After all, we are currently swimming in meat, and the next mushroom harvest is due in a few days too. A set of cargo pods then drops some valuable uranium for us. I'm sure we'll find a good use for that very soon. In the meantime, we are calling the orbital trader once more, this time to sell some of the stuff that we could also sell to the Empire, but again, Kevin will fetch a much better price than Brandon. And so, with the money we just made, we are then going to load up some transport parts. Once again, we are sending out Brandon and Lights as well as a good chunk of trade goods. Some chocolate, even some thrombo meat, plain leather, thrombo horns and plenty of silver. And it shouldn't take too long to load all of that into the parts. Light's scarless gene then also kicks in once more and that means, apart from a scar on his right leg, he is now officially scarless. Definitely a stark turnaround from his state at the beginning of the series. A few hours later then, our transport parts are ready to go and that means it's time for liftoff. Let's see what the Imperial settlement has in their inventory this time. Alright, so selling all of our goods makes us roughly 3,500 silver. And that's good because there are some things we want to buy here, starting with the gene pack for super fast wound healing, which at barely 600 silver is actually quite affordable. We definitely also want to grab the Farskip side trainer for Brandon. Thankfully, Farskip is only a level 5 psychast, and this removes the necessity to always bring light with us on these trips. Also for sale is a Persona Monosword, but I'm not quite sure I want to grab that. It's only of normal quality, and the kill first trade is not really a noticeable bonus. We could also grab ourselves a few more charge rifles, some recon armor, or even a prestige cataphract armor. Although with that one, I would rather pick up a regular one. The base price of the prestige version is more expensive by 800 silver, and for the final sale price, that's a difference of about 1,300. Still, let me know if there's anything on the list here that you think we should grab with our next trip. In the meantime, another fast skip brings our two traders back home, and with that, I think we can slowly wrap up today's episode. Brandon now learns the fast skip sidecast, and total colony wealth at the end of the episode here sits at about 206,000 not too far off of the 275,000 we need for the next piece of the Arconexus map. So we still have a bit of a way to go, but I think it's safe to say that we have already passed at the halfway point of this series. And with that, let's make the cuts and transition over to some fan arts. The first piece this week was sent in by Brit, and it's titled Ellie und das Nashorn. That's German for Ellie and the Rhinoceros. I suppose it can't hurt to learn a little German along the way. Submission number two then comes from none other than Isaac Young. This week a portrayal of the growing family, Squeaks took and their two children Ellie and Elpis. Isaac also once again wrote a bit of backstory that you can find in a comment down below. And if you want to submit some fan art of your own, then you know the drill. Simply send me an email to pete at petecomplete.com. 
And that's it for today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.